church. It's so good to see you today on this rainy Mardi Gras week, Mobile weekend. Amen. I'll tell you what, I, I made a deal with the Lord on our grand opening day at airport campus. I said, I'd never complain about the rain on a weekend again. If you just open up the skies and be good to us so we can get this parking lot in. I'll just tell you right now, I love the rain on Sundays. It's absolutely beautiful. I'm so glad. And so thank you guys for being here. I'm so, so thankful for what God is doing in our lives. I believe that he is not finished with us. He has a good plan for us. And I'm telling you today, I'm going to reach out. I'm going to say, God, I want you to help me to get this stuff down deep into my heart. Just a little bit more. Help me to hide your word in my heart. I don't want to sin against God, but I also want to walk in his blessings and walk in his purpose. Is there any, are there any people of purpose here in the house today? Amen. Amen. I want to say welcome to everyone that's joining us online right now and a good welcome to our airport campus. So thankful for what God is doing in you. Would you join me in bowing your heads? We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you today for your goodness in our lives and we we ask you to touch us one more time, Lord. I pray that you administer to us, draw us closer to you so that we could better reflect Jesus. Lord, we ask that you would expand the kingdom of God here in Mobile. Lord, let us be a part of that. I pray that you would Allow us to be right up in the middle of it. Transformation. People coming to know you. Father, families being stitched together. Prodigal sons and prodigal fathers coming back into relationship with one another, coming back into relationship with you. Father, we'll thank you. We don't take this for granted. It's such a privilege to be members of the kingdom of God. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, Pathway Church says amen. Amen. Now, today we start a new message series. It's called The Cloud. It's, it's a stewardship message series. It's talking about how we get to keep our stuff. How many of you want to keep your stuff? I mean, I don't like it when somebody shows up at my house and takes something from me. That's happened before. One time, somebody decided they want to take my bicycle while I was on it. I was 15 years old. That was no fun. That all happened across the street from the police station. Fortunately, I didn't have to win the fight. I just had to hold on long enough for somebody to get there. Nobody likes to have their stuff taken, and nobody likes to, ha- to lose their things either. We have all kinds of things to keep um, our stuff intact. We walk around trying to remember where our things are, and I don't know what your habits are. When I get up from a table, I kind of do one of these numbers, and I'm just like, keys, wallet, phone, keys, wallet, phone, glasses, I'm good. And uh, just trying to remember my things. But it's not that easy anymore. Now it's so much more complicated to keep our stuff. Anybody have some things on your phone that you'd like to keep? Some pictures. Somebody help me out. You got pictures. You got pictures of your babies. Music. You got to have your music, right? Um, I have uh, a notification on my phone that said, if I will allow my phone to delete my text messages that are over a year old, then it would free up 16 gig of memory on my phone. I can't bring myself to do it because you never know when you might need one of those text messages from back there somewhere. There's a picture, there's something. Problem was, um, this is not my regular phone. My regular phone is, it's, uh, it's inoperable now. I don't remember how it all started. Started somewhere, a little ding here, a little drop there. I have this bad habit when I'm driving in my car, I'll put it, my phone in my lap. Does anybody else do this? Just, come on. I just want to know. I'm not the only one that, with these kinds of problems. Get in my truck, and then I forget. I get out of the car, and it just goes flying across the parking lot. So that happened a few times, and um, I have one of these shields on my phone. It's, it's supposed to be bulletproof, and I guess if it breaks, you can actually get your money back or something. Well, the problem was it started bubbling up, and I didn't like how it looked, so I took it off thinking I put another one on. Yeah, so I dropped my phone and boom, the, the screen is gone. The phone's still working. I can still see stuff down through the cracks. And so I would push. I had to stop sliding my finger on it because I was getting little paper cuts. And then eventually it just started going black along the cracks. Now I could read, you, don't, you know you don't need all of the letters and words to be able to read. Do you know this? Do you know that you can write and eliminate all the vowels and still read what you write? In fact, that's how Ronald Reagan kept his notes. He just eliminated the vowels to save time. You can still read just fine. You get the idea. Some of us spell so bad, it's kind of like that anyway. So, 
My phone started doing that until eventually it just quit obeying me. It wouldn't do what I was telling it to do. And so I thought, this is not good. The good news was, though, I had saved everything to the cloud. That's some good stuff right there. That'll preach. It's going to preach today. Only problem for me is that phone was 128 gigs. This is 64 gigs. And so I have some stuff that's not even in my possession anymore. I have, it's advanced on up to the cloud. And really, that's how I hope that we learn to live our lives. In fact, you know, there's probably some good, there's a good message in this because I have deleted a lot of the apps that are on my phone that I didn't need clogging up. Some of them were little time wasters. And I don't, I mean, I don't know that you want to hear that your pastor plays video games on his phone, but I'm telling you, if I'm sitting somewhere and I've, I may have played Angry Birds a time or two, okay? <laughs> I don't know if you guys have that kind of, this kind of, but you know what? On a 64 gig phone, when I was used to having 128, I deleted a bunch of stuff until it's just the bare necessities. And you know, it feels pretty good. It feels pretty good. Not only there, but I've experienced this in my own life. If there was a, a situation, I've shared this before, where we had a problem, construction problem in our house, and so we moved out of our house and into another house. house was much smaller. We just started getting rid of stuff, and man, it felt really good. It felt really good not to have a bunch of stuff. In fact, if you, I don't know, this, is, this may be getting too personal, but have you noticed that all of your living space gets crowded up by a bunch of stuff that you store? You spend a lot of money for a house to live in, and you can't live in it because you can't park in your garage because it's full of stuff that you don't ever look at. And then that's not enough, so we go get storage units. No offense to folks that do storage units. It's good, good business. It works, it works for you. But have you noticed our stuff crowds us out? There are a lot of things that we get in life that it's really not doing a whole lot for us today. We just want to get more and more stuff. It's in us. I think what's happening is we're trying to scratch an itch with money and things, and it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. I mean, it feels good for a little bit when you get that new thing, but have you noticed it doesn't take long and it's just a thing. A lot of times your kids play with the boxes longer than they play with the toys that they get at Christmas because the luster is already worn off. I want to talk to you and kind of in that arena today, I just want to pastor you a little bit. Just have a family talk. Is that all right with you? Did we do that? We just have this conversation. We need to get this conversation. Some of us have gotten it. For some of us, it slid off the table a little bit. For some of us, we're new to Christ, and we're just kind of navigating down through this stuff, and we're, we're learning little by little. And I just want to encourage you, if you are new in Christ, or if you've been in Christ for some time, but the progress that you're making, you'd like to make it a little quicker, or you'd like to see bigger advances, then just hang in there and get a little closer to Jesus every day. That's my my hope for us. But for those of us that aren't just like down in the scriptures really good, we don't have this knowledge really good, there's some things that I'm going to share with you today that I believe they're going to bless your life and they're going to bless the kingdom of God. Um, And it has to do with the cloud. It has to do with the things that we store up in the cloud in heaven, the things we save. Let's save our stuff. Save our stuff. Reminds me, actually, of a joke. You may have heard this joke. Jesus and Satan were in an argument, and they were arguing over who was the better computer programmer. Have you ever heard this before? They get into this, it's like two hours, they're going back and forth. Finally, God the Father says, look, let's settle this thing with a contest. And uh, so Jesus is like, yes, fine. You know, Satan, he'd done this before. One time when he came down to Georgia, looking for a soul to steal, I think. So he had some practice. So they set some computers up, and they begin typing away furiously, lines and lines of code, and they're racking this stuff up, and just before the competition ended, lightning strikes, power goes down, computers drop. Satan is, you know, he's throwing a tantrum. He's pretty good at that. And he stands up, and he says, I have nothing. I lost it all when the power went out. Very well, God the Father said. He said, let us see if Jesus fared any better. Jesus entered a simple command screen comes to life in dis- full display. The voices of an angelic choir comes out of the speakers of the computer. And uh, Satan is astonished. Everything was there. He stuttered, but how? I lost everything, yet Jesus' program is intact. How did he do it? God the Father laughed, and he just said, Jesus saves. <laughs> so, he saves. Jesus saves. We only get to keep what we save. And we only get to save what we store up in the right place. I want to read uh, Matthew 6. We'll hear what Jesus says. But as we do, you're going to find two 
postures towards savings or two postures towards our investments. There's only two places we can invest, invest ourselves. Number one, we can invest ourselves in items that will disappear. Number one, invest ourselves in items that will disappear. Number two, we can store up treasures in the cloud or in heaven where they last forever. It's, I mean, it's not a physical cloud. You do understand when you go to heaven, you're not going to be like a little baby with wings floating in a Charmin commercial. <laughs> but in heaven, what we store up for eternity, that's all that's going to matter. Now, I'm not telling you not to get things. I mean, I'm glad that you're all clothed and largely in your right mind today. You came to church probably in a car and you're sitting in a nice place today. I'm thankful for that. We could have dressed differently. We could have spent less money on our clothes. I I don't see in the scriptures where God calls us to the lowest level of living possible. I don't see it. I don't see that he calls us to a Spartan, you know, like all of us show up in like croaker sacks. I, I don't see that. I mean, it's actually when I see in the scriptures, I see that God blesses his people. And, and I'm not talking about some kind of crazy prosperity theology. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. But, you know, we have a good father that loves his children. And he wants to do good things for his children. Now, he doesn't want to do good things that are going to damage us. There are things that my children ask for them, things that I am in my power to do, things I can do if I wanted to, but things in my judgment that I know that if I was to do them, that I would stunt the growth of my children. So God's not just like the head guy at the golden corral that you walk up to your plate and just starts heaping a bunch of stuff on you. But God wants to bless his children. And, and, and there's, there's a reason for it. And in the middle of all of that, I, I tell you, I'll tell you one thing. He doesn't want to do anything that would cause you to withdraw your heart from him. And I'm going to read this to you. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. Jesus says this. He says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Another translation says that's where your heart will be. I'm going to pause there just for a second. Let me say this. Whenever you bring the tithes or give in the offering at Pathway Church for the first time, then I send a book to you. It's called The Treasure Principle. It's by Randy Alcorn. It's one of my favorite books. It's blessed me. And so it's an investment back in you. And I, I believe it's a kind of thing. That it, it's based on this passage. And, and I think there are a couple, a couple different kinds of people in the world. I, and I don't know exactly how this all works out, but I know some of us, we throw our heart into something and then our resources and our time flows into it. And for others, maybe we're not as emotional. I mean, is there anybody that's just ooey-gooey emotional? You just, it's, just go ahead. Come on, help me out. Right? Like you'll cry. You watch Hallmark and you'll cry. It's the same plot every movie. Every movie, same plot. You're going to get to the right moment. They're going to start to kiss. Then the kids are going to walk in. Then they're not going to kiss. And there's some tragedy. And right at the end, everything is happy. Right? And then you're boohooing. You're crying. Right? Okay, all of you guys. You'll put your heart there. Your heart goes there first before anything else, and then your treasure and everything else flows. You give your, you give your heart to God, and then everything else just lines up. But for some of us, we're more logical and rational. Is there anybody here that's a more logical, rational person? You wish everybody else was logical. You don't understand why they're not. And you give formula, like you say, if you do this, then this is what will happen. And then people are talking about feelings, and you're like, come on, man. Just, just get past that part. If that's you, just go ahead and raise your hand. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Right. I think this passage is for us because it tells us if we want God to get our hearts, then let's take things that we value like our money and our time and let's just go ahead and give it to God. And when we do that, then our heart will follow. I don't care how you get your heart into the hands of God, but that's what he wants. Do you think God needs our money? No, just stop and think about that just for a second. Does God need our money? He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So if you're holding money, you're not holding your money. You're holding God's money. 
And one day he's going to get it anyway. He doesn't need that. What he wants, he wants your heart. He wants our hearts. Wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Verse 22 goes on. Jesus says, your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have, and and if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. And let me just say this to us today. One of the most dangerous places for us to be is covered up in religiosity, covered up in religion, thinking that we have the heart of God, and we don't. It's possible for us to do all the right things. It's possible for us to give an offering. It's possible for us to steward our resources well, to appropriate it well, to bring the tithe to the Lord, to give generously, to love our neighbor, to do good things for our neighbor, to help people, for us to get baptized a million times. We can still go to hell wet. We can do all of those things if God doesn't have our heart. What is this message, Pastor? Really, this message is, where is your heart? Have you put your heart in heaven? Verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. My hope for you today is that you would take your heart and your money today and you would store it in the cloud. Now I want to pause for a second and just address something briefly, your personal life and how you steward your resources I want to give you a quick formula. I wish I could hang out here longer. I've done this before. I want to continue to do it. I want to make sure that we're doing classes like uh, financial peace and uh, money matters in the church and do Dave Ramsey, you know, let's do crown financial. Let's do all of these things because we need to have order in every area of our life as, as, as believers. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time, but I do want to give this formula to you really quick. It, it's, it's just simple. It's 10, 10, 80. Say this with me. 10, 10, 80. One more time. 10, 10, 80. We want to bring the first 10% that we make to the Lord. 10%. That's called the tithe. The tithe. One time I had somebody say, Pastor, I don't even wear a tie. No, tithes. It just means a tenth. 10%. That's all it means. We give the Lord 10%. I mean, let me just say, boy, there are some amazing people here. That before they do anything, bring the tithe to the Lord. It's such a blessing. And some of those people have a lot and some of those people have a little. What's important about the tithe isn't the actual amount, but it's that it's proportionate to what we make. And we bring it to the Lord. Sometimes we say, I, I'm going to pay my tithes. We, don't, we really don't pay our tithes. We bring our tithes to the Lord. It's already His. It's not a bill. It all belongs to Him. Right? You bring those 10%. If you're new to the Lord, let me tell you, I have a friend, his name is Nelson Searcy. Nelson came to Christ by reading a Billy Graham book. And in the back of the Billy Graham book, it said, now do two, three, do do three things. Attend a Bible believing church. That totally sounds like Billy Graham, doesn't it? Attend a Bible believing church, read the Bible and tithe. And Nelson said, okay, I'm going to do those three things. He just began to do those three things. Those are good things to do. And giving and tithing, bringing the tithe to the Lord helps us to advance the ministry of the church, and it also helps us to make sure that we have submitted our heart to the Lord, that we're funding the the kingdom of God, and that we're being obedient to, to the word of God. But sometimes we're not able to bring that first 10% to the Lord because we're leveraged to our eyeballs. Did you know the average American lives on about 105% of their income each year? Just think about that for a second. We're borrowing more money than we're bringing in. A good friend of mine told me, he said, when our outflow exceeds our income, then our upkeep becomes our downfall. That's tough stuff right there. And you know what? That stuff doesn't get solved by making more money. Have you noticed that? That the more money you make, then the more money you spend. It's just an appetite. It's in us. It's just in us. God, help us. Help us. We don't want to be owned by that stuff. Last week I said, wouldn't it be great if we owned our possessions rather than our possessions owning us? I want to tell my money what to do. I don't want my money to tell me what to do. I don't want my kids telling me what to do. None none of us want to be bossed around by something that we should be leading. And so sometimes we're unable to bring the tithe to the Lord or to give. Or Sometimes there's like a free will moment. Maybe there's a neighbor that has a need or a situation. You know, we're about to send a bunch of people over to Cambodia. and, And, you know, there are some things that we would like to do, even things that we would like to do as a church that we can't do 
because we need to continue to work and develop our, the, the finances of, of the ministry, the finances of our lives. I mean, there are times where, man, the Lord's prompted me to give, and I'm, I'm thinking, I don't know if I can do that. that. What I just heard, that can't be from the Lord because that hurts. That hurts a little bit. David said this. He said, I won't give a gift that doesn't cost me something. Sometimes we just can't, though, because we have kind of racked up a lifestyle where now we're borrowers and we're a slave to the lender and we can't do anything but pay this stuff back. 10, 10, 80 says, I'm going to give 10% to the Lord. I'm going to give myself 10%, whether that's towards retirement or investing it back into a business, something that's going to grow and then live off of 80%. If we can get to this point where we're living off of 80%, we've done a lot to crush that consumeristic drive in our heart that really controls us. I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. I, will, I want to make a couple book recommendations and encourage you. We do have like financial peace or uh, we have a Money Matters small group uh, right now that you can be a part of. Um, a book that I'd like to recommend, one financial peace by Dave Ramsey. Eat that stuff up. I'm telling you, I was in seminary. I had put my last semester on my Discover card. The entire semester, it was no fun at all. I ate beans and like frozen pizzas, ramen noodles for like two years getting that stuff <laughs> sorted out. I read Financial Peace and I snowballed my debt and it was one of the best things I have ever done. I would encourage you to grab a hold of something like that. There's another book by Randy Alcorn. It's called Money, Possessions, and Eternity. And that's a big, it's a big read. I have a copy. It's dog-eared all up. I've underlined it all up. Many times over, it's a, it's a really wonderful book. I'd, I'd really encourage you to get it. Bottom line, you know, trust the Lord with the tithe, make preparation for the future, and then live off the rest. Whatever you have to do to get there. If you've got you to work an extra job to peel back some stress that you've added up over the years, it's worth it. It's worth it. Maybe three jobs. Maybe a little side thing. Facebook Marketplace. Sell some of the stuff that you're storing up that moth can eat and rust can corrupt. Get rid of some of that stuff. Pay off some debt. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with new stuff. But there's also nothing wrong with driving a used car until you get debt off of your back. There's nothing wrong with that. Let me say, if we would do whatever it is we have to do so that we can get into a position where we're prepared for the future and where we're able to uh, bless the kingdom, advance the kingdom, wouldn't that be an awesome thing? What do you think would happen in Mobile if we owned our possessions and our possessions didn't own us? Oh, would you just stop and dream with me just for a minute? What would happen? I think it would be a beautiful thing. Already God has done so much. But I think the Lord wants to do a little more in our, in our lives. Listen. I was talking with a friend of mine this week as I was preparing for the message. And uh, he doesn't usually ask me what I'm preaching about. He lives in another town. And he said, what are you preaching about this week? And I said, well, I'm... I, I explained what I just did. And he said, oh man, let me just tell you, there are some, object, some objections that people have whenever a preacher talks about money. Now this is the point where you could say, you could look back on this part of the message and say, well, pastor, you're defensive. L- let me just say, I- I'm not being defensive. I just want to deal with this objection so we can move on. Is that good? Is that okay with you guys? I mean, this is just a family talk. We can just put it all out there. Isn't that a whole lot better than us just kind of tiptoeing around and not trying not to offend anybody? Isn't that a whole lot better? Can we just be real? Come on, man, you better help me out. Can we just be real? Okay, so he says, Pastor, sometimes when a preacher talks about money, then the first thing that people say is all churches ever want to talk about is money. Maybe you've heard that or you've thought that. Maybe you haven't thought that, but you've heard that said. And I, I loved what he said. My friend really spends his life working so that he can give money away to help people. He said, Pastor, whenever somebody says that, he said, really, I can understand a non-Christian saying that, but a Christian should never say that. He says, if a Christian says that, this is what he said, this is my favorite line from him. He said, he says, you can smell the smoke on that one. Uh, what do you mean? Unpack that. He said, yeah, it doesn't come from that person. That person isn't saying it. That's just a lie from the enemy. That's just where that comes. Don't take it personal on that person, but just know where that just know where that comes from. And he said, if you could tell your church anything, tell them that I said this. He said, 
enemy would love to sideline the Christian from obedience and tithing and giving, he said one of the greatest tools of the enemy is to keep us selfish. That's really good. Really good. I'm convicted. I'm convicted. I want God to give me a generous heart. I want, I want 2018 to be the most generous year I've ever had. I want it to be one of the most effective years I've ever had. I want it to be one of the best years for the Johnson family. And you know what? I want to do my part as the dad and as the husband. And in helping to bring order to our finances so that the Lord would be blessed. And so that our family would be blessed. That, that's my hope. And I hope that the words that I speak would be seen in the balance that's in my checkbook. It's really nice for us to talk about giving. And it's good for us to kind of posture ourselves. But what would happen if the Lord just looked into our checkbook and said, well, you know, you talk a good game, but you don't walk a good game. My prayer is this year would be the most generous year of my life. And that's my prayer for our church. Now, let me get back to this objection really quick, okay? Because I just want to, I just would like to really just drive a dagger in this thing. You know, I'm going to get paid whether you decide to tithe and give today or not. You, you know, I don't make a commission on the offerings. Do you know that? You know that, right? And did you know that there's not an, I don't have an ownership stake in, in this church. I mean, I, I own it because I'm a part of the kingdom of God. But you know, there's nothing that says like a 25% owner or 50% owner. Like I didn't negotiate that in the contract. You know, I pastored a church for almost 14 years. We started with 27 people. We met in a movie theater for seven years, setting it up and tearing down. Every weekend, church grew. We bought a building, renovated a building. We grew. We got a bigger piece of property, filled that building a few times. And in about six months before I resigned as pastor there, we paid off that property completely. It was the largest Protestant church property in a city of four and a half million people. God helped us. And you know what? When I resigned there, you know what? You know what my gift was as I exited as an owner of that church? You know what my gift was? Pathway Church was my gift. I got you. I'm just a steward. We're just a steward. There's no, there are no owners in this church. This doesn't belong to anybody. It's a non-profit organization. I mean, that's what the, that's what the U.S. says about us. In other countries, it would be called an NGO, a non-governmental organization. Yeah. Basically, it means that nobody owns this place. It's not like a business. It's not like if you own a barber shop or you own a retail shop or a construction company, anything like that. This place is it's to be stewarded. In fact, if, if this place went defunct, then everything would be sold off and it would be given to another church or something like that. There's nobody that would profit from it. So I'm, I'm why, Pastor, why are you saying that? Well, I told you, this is where you could think I'm being defensive, but I just want you to know that me getting you to bring more tithes or more offerings into the church, it's not going to result in me driving a Bentley into the church property. You know what I'm saying? You know what I want to do? I want you to be able to put your heart right into the hands of God because where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And not only does that get us closer to the Lord, it also helps us to reach our city. How many of you want to see Mobile come to Jesus Christ? Sure want to see that. I want to see it more than I want to see just about anything else. And if we're faithful to bring the tithes to the Lord, if we're faithful, you know, right in the middle of For God in Our City, Pastor, is this a sales job to increase For God in Our City? Well, we did put them both together because we want to be For God in Our City. We're rolling this thing out. We want to do some things. In fact, at the end of this message, I'm going to show you where the first piece of money from the Forgotten Our City campaign went to. It went to a guy by the name of Michael Williams. Pastor Michael Williams went to launch a brand new church in Madison, Alabama called New Life Chapel. So you guys gave last, last week, received, received for God in our city money. Boom, that check was gone. That's why we want to give. There are other things. We're going to give to more church plants. We're going to do some things to get out into the city. But, you know, it's not... I don't want you to give so that our budget can be bigger next year. In fact, let me just tell you, the bigger the budget is, the faster the plane is flying, the more difficult it is to handle everything. And I'll tell you, there is a sweet spot where you could, hey, I could just preach on Sunday and do some fishing during the week, play some golf. I'm not really designed for that. 
How about this? Let's not take it easy. Let's go for more of Jesus. More of us in this city and more of God in us. And that's, that's what I'm after. So I'm just, just trying to help you deal with that. And so at the end of the day, church doesn't own, uh, belong to me. The church is the Lord's. So when I'm talking about us bringing the tithe and the offering, what I'm going after is for us to go after God, make his name great. You know, the truth is we probably don't teach enough on money. Jesus talked about faith about 500 times, fewer than 500 times, actually. He talked about prayer. Actually, the Bible talks about prayer fewer than 500 times. But there are over 2,000 verses on money in the Bible. In fact, Jesus, 15% of the time that he was talking, was talking about money and stewardship. So I speak about money and stewardship about two or three times a year. But if I was to get on that 15% plan, then I should be speaking about seven or eight times a year, Sundays a year. I'm not going to let a cultural moment where a few pastors, a few people that are public, have given the church a bad rap. Let me tell you, most churches and most pastors are sacrificial. They love the Lord, and they're going all out. That is the standard. That's typical. That's the norm. It's exceptional when you have this crazy stuff going on. I'm not going to let a few people that are like that stop us from being a robust church that goes after this city. We're just not going to do it. Amen. I think we ought to just go ahead and bless the Lord right there. Amen. One other objection, really quickly. Some people say the tithe is an Old Testament function. Matthew 23, 23, Jesus addresses this. He says you ought not to, uh, he says you ought to tithe, but you ought not to neglect the weightier things in the law, such as justice, faith, and mercy. So it's not mutually exclusive. It's not either or. It's like let's love our neighbor and let's bring the tithe. Let's, Let's honor the Lord with our finances. Hebrews 2 tells us everything belongs to the Lord. Romans 8 and 9 tells us that if the Spirit of God is living in us, then we belong to the Lord, a whole person, everything that we have. First Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 12 says, wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. I would say, so let's not hold back from God and let's find, instead let's find more ways to give. God, help us to be more creative in creating resources to get into the world for the sake of Christ. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 18. Listen to this, man. Somebody grab a hold of this. This isn't for everybody. This isn't going to be for everybody. Some people are just going to, yeah, it's not really for me, but listen to this. Listen to this. Deuteronomy 8 and verse 18. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. Or the New Living Translation says he is the one who gives you the power to be successful. Promotion, it it doesn't come from the north or the south. It doesn't come from any man. It doesn't come from your ingenuity. It comes from the Lord. He gives us, if you have the ability, some people can just make money. If you have that ability, it's because God gave you that ability. At the end of the day, here's what I see. This is what I see, and this is kind of where I want us to end. I want you to know this. That we are blessed to be a blessing. I don't want you to think of your life, like if your life is in a neighborhood that you would be on the cul-de-sac, that all the blessings come to the end of the street and just pool up with you. Don't think of your life as a cul-de-sac. Think of your life as a highway. God, if you can get it through me, I know you'll get it to me. Lord, you've blessed me for a reason so I can bless others. That's what the Lord wants to do in us. God wants to bless us. He wants us to be found faithful. He wants our heart to be in his hand. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 2 really lays this out. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. How many of you want to be great? I mean, I'm not talking about rock star famous, but how many of you want to be better than you are? Is that, you want, just a little closer to Jesus. Lord, if you give me influence, I'll use it for your glory. We don't need another narcissist in the church. We don't. We don't need another person that's saying it's all about me. We don't need that. But what if we said, God, if you help me to be more influential, I'll do, I'll take that influence and I'll use it for your glory. Wouldn't that be awesome? 
He says, he says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. My friend in our conversation the other day, he went on to say that the enemy wants to stop the tithes, the offerings, the generosity, because he wants to stop the blessing. Not only the blessing out there, but the blessing for you, for the blessing in the life of the giver. We make the mistake to think, in thinking that the way to get more is to hold on to it more tightly. It's not. Listen to Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 25. In fact, write this down. Maybe put this on your mirror. It'll change the way you talk to your kids. It'll, it'll change the way you interact with your neighbors. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. Oh, so good. We're never more like God than when we give. For God so loved the world that he gave. God wants to do that in us today. That's how I want to pray for you right now. Is there anybody, and let me, let me do this. I'm going to ask some stuff that you're not going to want to raise your hand and other people see. So I'm going to ask a few questions and then you can find safety in the crowd, okay? By the time we get to the end, we should all have the opportunity to say, God, I want you to do this good work in me. First question I want to ask, though, is pretty pointed. I say, Pastor, I would, there are so many things I would like to do to be generous to the Lord, but I have hemmed myself into so much financial difficulty. I'm in debt. I'm, I'm, I'm distressed. Feels like I'm having a heart attack sometimes. My back muscles are so tight from this stress. And I need God to do something in me. I need him to help me reprioritize my life. In just a minute, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Don't do that right now. You say, Pastor, I love the Lord. My heart is in his hand, but I'm going to ask that God will continue to bless me and help me to find creative, more creative ways to bless the Lord in my finances. That's the second thing. And the third thing is you say, Pastor, I want to pass on a heart of generosity to my children and to other people. I want a culture of generosity around me. If that's you in any one of those three things, would you just raise your hand right now? Just go ahead and lift that up to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, I just come to you right now for my brothers and sisters, Lord, who are asking you to do a good work in them. Father, I pray that you would bring strength. Father, I lift up, especially today, my friends who are bound up in debt, maybe from bad decisions. Wouldn't surprise me. All of us have made them may have come because of some financial, some, some medical situation or some situation that was beyond their control. It doesn't matter what it is, Lord. I just pray that you would speak wisdom and insight into their life and help them navigate through this. Father, I pray for us as a church family that we would stir up ways for us to give and to be generous to you. And in doing so, Lord, I pray that you would expand the borders of our tent. And Lord, that you would be made great among us, Lord. Father, that it would be clear where our treasure is in the cloud and that our heart's in your hand. Lord, we'll thank you and we'll bless you for that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Can we bless the Lord really quick? So good.